Good morning, everybody. You know, as I prepared this week, I had an image in my head that I was reminded of last weekend. If you could take a camera back to the 18th, the early 18th century, and zoom in on the Wesley household, you'd see 10 kids running around. It's crazy. You pan through the house and you see studying, you see chores being done, you see food being cooked, and occasionally you'd see a mom with an apron pulled up over her head. And, and, and again, if you're filming this, you quickly pivot back and think, what in the world is going on? Why is she doing this? Well, I mean, a good guess, honestly, would be that she needs some quiet time to herself. Or maybe they've just sent her over the edge, right? Why would she do that? Well, she was praying. Her instructions to her kids, I don't know if she verbally told them or had them written somewhere, but they probably read something like, Thou shalt not disturbeth me when I preside under the apron. I am praying to God Almighty, he who can smite you. Or he might even instruct me to do that. (laughs) All kidding aside, she did tell her kids, though, when she was praying that she was not to be disturbed when she had the apron up over her. Again, because she was praying right? Her name was Susanna, and she went on to have two famous boys, John Wesley, who was really one of the founders of Methodism, and Charles Wesley, who was one of our greatest celebrated hymnists, all because I think partially she took the time to pray. One of the greatest questions that we can ask as humans is why. Why, 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 why? Why, mom? Why, dad? Why, God? Well, perhaps some of you today are even asking that question of us as a church. We've been going through this Missions in May initiative, and you're wondering, why are we doing this? Why bring the hope of the gospel to neighbors and nations? Now, that may not be uh, many of us in here, but you're asking why. Why bring the hope of the gospel to neighbors, right? One thing I'm going to be talking about today. I mean, maybe you think they'll just reject me. Anyways, why do we really need to care about the nations? We have problems here in the U.S. that we need to spend time fixing. Further, in a a world of you do you, right, why should we even bring the gospel to anyone? Isn't it somewhat pushy, offensive, and even in this day and age, taboo? Well, I can't get into everything this morning, and I can't possibly come at it from all the angles, What I do want to do is answer that why question from Scripture as I talk with you today about our neighbor opportunities. Brian mentioned last week that I'd be doing that and going more in-depth, and here I am to do that for us today. So why are we working with Vision House? We mentioned them as one of the five priorities that we're doing last week. Why are we leaning into our relational networks? Why, Why are we doing that? And again, If you have, um, maybe from last week, and we have more out in the front, this brochure that we handed out, uh, this will go over our values, our mission statement, the neighbors and nations priorities that we have. So I would encourage you to keep this for the remainder of May in your Bibles as you come to church. Um, I have have a definition of us uh, for us before I really start into things when I'm talking about neighbors and nations, because perhaps some of you weren't here last week. Sunday. Here's what we mean by neighbors and nations. Neighbors are those who, those people whom we typically have interactions with without crossing major cultural, geographic, and linguistic boundaries. The people maybe that you live next door to, the people that your kids play baseball with and their fam- families and parents. Maybe um, and, and, and those people that you don't have to cross any major cultural, linguistic, or geographic boundaries to happen to. Those are n- n- uh, neighbors. And then nations are people all over the world where we have to cross cultural, geographic, and linguistic boundaries to even just have a conversation, right? So when we're talking about neighbors today, I want you to keep that in mind. It's the people that we don't really have to, you know, do much to communicate with them, to talk with them, right? We can just pick up where we want to, right? So I want to answer that why question, but I also want to do something and say, I want to show you what you can expect. Maybe some of you already know what you can expect. 
But I want to, again, go to Scripture, and lo and behold, from the same passage, bringing the hope of the gospel, we'll see, to all kinds of people, results in all kinds of responses. So as we spend time in Scripture, I want to unpack, after we spend time in Scripture, I want to then unpack more lean, uh, uh, what we're doing with Vision House and what we're going to be doing with My Relational Networks, and we have some informational videos to show you today. So it won't just all be me diatribing today, okay? So here we go. Um, I am reminding myself and reminding you that even though we're speaking obvious things, right, when we talk about why share the gospel, to us, maybe some of us, that's obvious because the gospel is so good. It's great news. But I want to remind us that much of the Christian life is reminding ourselves of what we profess and who we are as Christians. So I think it's always good to have a reminder. With that, I want you to start turning your Bibles to Acts chapter 17. Acts chapter 17. Acts 17 is where we're at, starting in verse 16. And again, my question for us is this. As we bring the hope of the gospel, why, why do it and what can we expect? Why do it and what can we expect? Read with me Acts chapter 17, starting in verse 16. We're just going to read the first two verses here. Now, while Paul was waiting for them at Athens, his spirit was provoked within him as he saw that the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and the devout persons and in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be here. Let's go ahead and pause right there. Let's remember Paul's context here for those of us that haven't read Acts recently. Paul has just come from, come from Berea where he was sharing with the Bereans about the good news of Jesus. And they were studying the scriptures. But he gets chased out by Jews from Thessalonica that were jealous um, of him, right? And then he gets shipped off to Athens by himself, modern day Greece. And he tells Silas and Timony, Timothy, his partners in crime, to come to him as soon as possible, right? So here he is waiting for them in the city of Athens, What's he to do without his buddies? Well, again, a couple of things I want to highlight from this text that shows us why we bring the hope of the gospel to our neighbors. I'm just going to point out a couple of things from what we just read, right? Verse 16 said, His spirit was provoked within him as he saw the city full of idols. His spirit was provoked within him. So again, here's Paul waiting around, getting stirred up because he sees all these idols, all the gods that the Athenians worship. And, and he can't just sit there and wait. And again, one of the best ways to kind of describe this Greek word would be, you know, you kind of get um, indignant, maybe a little irritated, right? When we provoke people, they can get, you know, fiery, right? So Paul's looking at these idols. Maybe you've been, uh, one of the things that always upset me as a kid and still to this day when I see a bully be, uh, bullying someone, I want to go do something about it, even though I'm not the, the fighter kind of guy. Something within me is provoked to go stop that, right? So again, here's Paul seeing the famous Parthenon dedicated to Athena, the spots of worship given to Poseidon, and probably many other gods, some of the 12 famous Greek gods that we know to this day. What he only had heard about probably up to this point, he now sees in full splendor. And he's torn up about it because all these temples represent people who are worshiping false gods, not the one true God who has revealed himself in Jesus Christ. And again, let me sum up something probably way too quickly about idolatry. Idolatry is trusting in created things rather than the creator for our hope and happiness, significance, and security. It's an attack on God's exclusive rights to our love, trust, and obedience. So here's Paul, indignant that this city is bursting at the seams with representations of people who give their love, trust, and obedience to other gods when the one true God is the one who has created them. One more thing to say on this, by the way, is that behind those idols, there's not just nothing, right? And Paul even says in 1 Corinthians 10, that behind those idols lie enemies, demons, he says in 1 Corinthians 10, minions of the adversary who seek to devour and destroy us. 
So let us not think, by the way, that we are free from these idols and schemes of the evil one today. (laughs) We may not worship gods like the Greeks, but we still worship things like money, power, and sex. And those three areas, with all their gnarly tentacles, have destroyed many people and many families too. So Paul, seeing all this, chooses to do something about it. He goes, and as he's waiting, remember friends, God still works even when situations aren't ideal. He doesn't have his partners in crime, his buddies in ministry. When I do a Wednesday night without my wife, there, she's usually with their, me there every, every Wednesday night. When I do a youth ministry, Wednesday night youth groups without her, I feel like a half-inflated balloon. But I often have to tell myself that God can still work even when she's not present. God still works even when we're missing something, even when we're not whole. So Paul was waiting, and yet here he is, the text says, heading to the marketplace in the synagogues, telling people about Jesus and the resurrection. Every day, it says in verse 17. He's taking every opportunity while he's waiting. We have to remember, just like him, that we have daily opportunities to proclaim Jesus in our workplaces, in our schools, at the field, and in our clubs, and at our coffee shops. So, Why bring the hope of the gospel to neighbors? I want to answer that question right here, part part one really of our, our big question is, because false worship provokes us to action. False worship provokes us to action. We are compelled to proclaim this good news with a broken world, to beat back the gates of Hades, to loosen the bonds of Satan's chains upon this world and to bring people into a living communion with God Almighty. That's what we do when we bring the hope of the gospel to our neighbors. May we never forget that. Oh, man, I could camp out here longer. I'm going to have to move on though. So. Um, so we've seen the why. False worship provokes us to action. That's what we've seen here in Acts 17. We've seen the why. But what else can we expect, right? What, what can we expect? Well, now we're going to head to the end of the chapter in Acts 17 to see what we can expect. Paul, after his daily proclamation, he gets some curious people, right? People are like, what, what is this babbler saying? It's kind of a derogatory term, right? His, he gets invited to the Areopagus, uh, Mars Hill, and the ruling council of a- Athens hears him out, right? Paul In that statement, and again, I'm summarizing the chapter for us before we end in the last couple of verses. Paul masterfully weaves together a sermon that is saturated with the Old Testament without referencing it once. And yet he, again, so he never quotes it. And yet he instead quotes their own writers and their own poets to build his defense. So what happens at the end? What happens after Paul gives his speech, gives his spiel? Look with me in verses 32 through 34. Paul has just said that God has given us assurance that he will do these things by raising him, Jesus, from the dead. And verse 32 says, Now when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked. But others said, We will hear you again about this. So Paul went out from their midst, but some men joined him and believed, among whom also were Dionysius the Areopagite and a woman named Damaris and others with them. So what can we expect? Three simple observations from those last couple of verses. I'm going to put them on the screen and kind of just quickly go through them. What can we expect when we do bring the hope of the gospel to our neighbors? Because guess what? I don't know if you've ever done this before, but when you sometimes share the hope of the gospel, it's not always just like people just believe on the spot, baby. That actually really doesn't happen, especially out here in Seattle. You got to get through some, you got to get over some hills, through some valleys, Now, that doesn't mean, though, that God can't work, and I'll kind of talk about that. But what happens? What can we we expect when we do bring the hope of the gospel to our neighbors? Some may mock. There's a famous atheist. Luckily, he's he's kind of uh, on the outs. Uh, Richard Dawkins is his name, and some Christian beliefs he's said to his own people in a big audience, saying, when you hear them, and you hear them talking about these things, mock them, ridicule them publicly, He wants us to feel stupid and belittled. 
that we even exist in this 21st century. I remember some of my football friends mocking me in high school for some of the things that I would be open about um, with my Christian faith. And I was constantly having to feel these questions and different things like that. And uh, it was actually in middle school when I told, you know, one uh, young guy. And again, I, I kind of grew up in the youth group purity culture movement. And I was talking to him about the silver ring thing that I went to. And actually, now I have a silver ring. So anyways, um, talking about, you know, wanting to save uh, my relations, sexual relations for marriage, right, with my wife. And I had all kinds of dudes hearing me listen to this and then mocking me, especially those that were already sexually active, mocking me as well. So we can expect sometimes, and again, I, I was talking about that, not necessarily uh, the, the gospel, but we can expect sometimes that we'll be mocked. We can expect also that there would be curiosity. It said that some said, we will hear you again about this, right? Maybe you've shared some gospel things and you haven't really just had people come at you, but you know, they're just kind of shaking their head, maybe ask some good questions and you know, you kind of leave the conversation, you're like, I don't know where that ended up, but you could see maybe a spark of curiosity. I was uh, a caseworker in a foster care home in Spokane before I moved to Dallas, and uh, there was this kid named David. He was 17 years old, and he told me uh, very early on that he knew he would never amount to anything because his dad was good for nothing, and that's how I know that I'm going to be. And I remember sharing with the gospel and telling him that that doesn't have to be the case. And he had kind of gone to youth group every now and then, and uh, he seemed curious. He seemed interested. And we had some follow-up conversations, but to this day, I still don't know what happened with David. But we still should be willing to proclaim it. Some may be curious. And lastly, some may believe, right? Dionysius the Areopagite. This guy was known as the Areopagite. He was someone who spent a lot of time here, hearing a lot of people talk about the something new that was interesting, right? Even that guy believed, and a woman named Damaris and others with them. So Paul's speech, his proclamation about the good news of Jesus had some effect. Some did indeed believe and started following him. And we pray that they became maturing disciples of Jesus who got plugged into the local body there once it was started. C.S. Lewis, author of the Chronicles of Narnia, um, Space Trilogy series, Mere Christianity, we know him as a Christian, but for a lot of his young adult life, he was an atheist. And through his conversations with Christians, talking with them, and, and C.S. Lewis, he's, he's no intellectual slouch. He was a wicked, brilliant guy. And up until a certain point, he thought that there was nothing that could convince him otherwise. He just thought Christianity was just like the other myths, just like the other tales. And through his conversations with guys like J.R.R. Tolkien and others that he went and worked with in a group called the Inklings, uh, well, even, this was uh, before the Inklings, but anyways, even C.S. Lewis the celebrated Christian author was at one point an atheist too. But that didn't keep the Christians in his life from sharing the good news of Jesus with him. What can we expect? There may be mockery. There may be curiosity. And maybe, by God's good grace, some will believe. But let me tell you this. I was reading online, I don't have the exact statistics, but in a recent poll, again, the number one thing that keeps us from Sharing or really proclaiming the good news of Jesus is fear. That's one of the number one things. Rejection, whatever it might be. But uh, when, we, when we come into a conversation scared and fearful, it often means that we already think we know the outcome. Fear should not keep us from proclaiming the good news of Jesus because we don't know the outcome. We don't know what will happen in those conversations. We may be mocked. We may receive some curiosity, and again, by God's good grace, some may believe. But just never forget this, God is always moving. Now I'm going to turn here in the last um, section for our vision house and relational networks opportunities. But I want you to remember what I asked at the beginning. As we bring the hope of the gospel to the world, why do we do it? And what can we expect? 
Well, I have our answer here on the screen behind me. We bring the hope of the gospel to our neighbors with provoked hearts, expecting different responses. And one of those responses responses may even be belief. We want to be people who are compelled. That's one of our values for our neighbors and nations efforts. We want to be people who are provoked when we see the brokenness all around us to go and share about the good news of Jesus. We want to have a group of people here in this church who are not just Sunday pew sitters. And I know that's not you. But I, 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 I want us to be, go beyond that and remember that we have hearts that should be compelled to go and proclaim the good news of Jesus and trust by God's good grace that some will respond. But to never forget, even though we may be mocked, even though some may just be curious, that God is always moving and fear should not keep us from proclaiming that. Okay, now that we've laid our scriptural foundation, I want to spend the latter half again of my time looking into Vision House and my relational networks. And as we do that, I'm going to kind of mention the why and what of each uh, opportunity, each priority, okay? So I now have a video for us from Melissa Gehrig, the executive director of Vision House, and we're going to hear, more her, from, we're going to hear from her and to, to learn more about the organization. I'm Melissa Gehrig, Executive Director, and I am so honored and privileged to be able to share the work of Vision House and the impact that your community has on the families that we serve. Vision House is a nonprofit ministry that for the past 32 years has provided transitional housing with supportive services to families with children who are experiencing homelessness. We're not an emergency shelter. Our families stay with us for an average of 16 months. And you know that homelessness is a crisis in the Puget Sound area right now, with more than 12,000 people counted as homeless in 2020, and 32% of those individuals were families with children. It's also important to know that there are four subgroups of homelessness. Chronic individual homelessness is huge, and that's who we most often see on the streets. Veterans, unaccompanied youth, and families with children. Families with Children is the population that we serve at Vision House. We own 46 apartments in Renton and Shoreline. Both locations have child care centers as well. And we are unique in that we give families time to heal from the trauma of homelessness. We also believe that homelessness is more than a resource issue, but is a relationship issue. It's people who have had broken relationships or a lack of a stable, supportive relationship in their life. At, at Vision House, we give families an opportunity to develop trusting relationships and learn to live in healthy community. Vision House is also unique in that we are, over the 32 years we've been in ministry, our success rate has been 92% of moving families from instability to stability in permanent housing. In that time, we provide complete wraparound services, including life skills classes, such as financial literacy, healthy boundaries and relationships, housing sustainability, household management, employment support, education support, and Bible studies. We are one of the only organizations in the area that will accept a family with boys over the age of 12. We are also unique in that we will accept larger families because that's a huge need in our community. Just recently, we retrofitted an apartment for a mom and a dad and their six kids. We serve single mothers, single fathers with children, as well as two parent families. I believe that together, we can make an impact on families experiencing homelessness and to help them realize everything that God has created them to be. Thank you. That was just a short little video that shows, again, some of what Vision House is doing. But one thing I wanted to focus on here, tying it to, to my sermon again today, is you heard Melissa say that homelessness isn't really just a resource issue, issue primarily. 
uh, it's a relationship issue. And so as we seek to be relational, again, one of our values for our neighbors and nations um, efforts, as we seek to be relational, We want to remember that bringing the hope of the gospel brings more than just salvation for souls. So again, why why partner with the Vision House? Because we think that the gospel is holistic. That not only does it save people, make them right with God, but it fixes broken lives. Not always perfectly, not easily, but it fixes broken lives because we're heading to a new world one day where all things will be made new and the brokenness that has ravaged humanity for all history past will be done away with. And we bring the healing, the salvation, holistically into this present now by bringing the hope of the gospel to our friends, to our neighbors. Again, I think quickly of Jesus proclaiming the good news everywhere he went in his ministry. But if we again read the gospels, what was another major thing that he was doing? He was healing people. He was casting out demons. He was working with those that were sick and poor and disenfranchised, those that the religious elite would not touch with a 10-foot pole. And here was Jesus in his ministry proclaiming that good news of the kingdom. So what can we expect? Again, why, why work with Vision House? Because they are bringing holistic healing to people's lives, 92% is their success rate. And what you can expect is that broken people will be made whole by Christ and his people, us. Don't ever forget the 8%, 92, 8%, don't forget that. It may not always be perfect. But as we partner with Vision House, we're gonna see that God is working in many, many ways. Here's some of the ways that we plan to get involved with Vision House, actually. They have plenty of opportunities. Again, Shoreline, the Shoreline campus is, is also called Jacob's Well. That's their expression in apartments here in, in just a, a, a few miles from us. And one of the ways that we can be involved in the church is, is through this. Care for children. Provide evening meals for women. Help a child at their homework labs. And they need people to help run their events, to do some fundraising, to do maybe do some office work on occasion. A few more opportunities on the next slide or maintenance. If you're handy and you can do some maintenance, they always appreciate that. You can provide support to their family services staff. They have a number of staff who work with the families that they're supporting, and we can go and be support to that staff who I'm sure has a lot going on in their lives as they take care of these people. And also, one of the big ways that we've already been doing for a long time is pray for Vision House staff and the families. And again, we plan on doing some things with Vision House soon. If you recall, Peter Nordland has been hired as our new Neighbors and Nations Director. And we hope to, um, very uh, soon in the near future, uh, to start serving with Vision House in in a very tangible way. Again, you can pray on Sunday mornings for our opportunities for different things like that, but we are asking that people would get involved. So, um, I want to share more about that, but I want to move on to my relational networks as well. And here's what we we mean by that, is that all those different social connections you have in life, at work, in your neighborhood, with your kids, in your clubs and gyms, um, that's what we're talking about when we're saying my relational networks, right? We interviewed someone uh, who I think uh, typifies what we mean by relational networks, and that's Dave Schlack. So we're going to watch this video together. Well, um... Good morning, everybody. I'm Pastor Nick, and I'm here with Dave Schlack today. And you've been hearing me talk a little bit this morning about my relational networks. And I'm just going to talk with Dave a little bit about that today because I think he's someone who is already kind of doing what we're hoping and imagining for in my relational networks and tapping into what you already have existing in your lives and saying, how can we bring the hope of the gospel to our neighbors that we already have right before us, right? So Dave, just tell everybody a little bit, I don't think everybody maybe knows you in um, the church, I'm sure many do, but tell us a little bit about who you are and your family, kind of what what makes the Schlack family tick. Sure. Uh, I'm Dave Schlack, my wife Becky and I have four boys, Andrew who's a senior at Edmonds Woodway, John who's a sophomore at Edmonds Woodway, Nate, seventh grader at College Place, and Ben, a fourth grader at Sherwood Elementary. All right, and they're involved in sports, right? 
lots of sports. In fact, I was thinking earlier, I think we've had, we've been involved in 13 years of youth sports to date and have, after this year, another eight to go until Ben is done with high school. So wow. potentially 21 years of youth sports. Wow. Um, and you've coached a number of times, volunteered, just yep. a whole bunch of different things. Yeah, I've coached or been an assistant coach uh, for most of these years in soccer, baseball, and football. Yeah. Wow. So I remember a number of men's breakfasts ago, you know, we were kind of just touch, touching on, you know, how do we maybe, and, and this was prior to us really landing on my relational networks, but how do we just have our eyes open to needs in our community, right? And you had mentioned um, that you were kind of doing that as a coach um, and thinking about um, the kids and the, and the parents that you were working with, right? Why, what would possess you to, to do something like that? Share maybe a little bit about that men's breakfast and why you were. Sure. Um, well, I'll, I'll step back just a little bit. Um, <clears throat> was it a number of years back, I don't remember exactly how, uh, how much, but when the light bulb went on that there are all these people that we're involved with through youth sports. And uh, you know, there's a lot going on in their lives and it's a great opportunity for us to be a light in this community. And uh, as, as a perfect example, um, one football season this last year, uh, we had of the 22 boys on the team, uh, I knew of four families that were having challenges. We had uh, one boy who hadn't even seen his dad in a few months because his dad was in the ICU with dealing with COVID complications. We had, uh, uh, let's see, oh, we had another boy whose parents are divorced, but his mom was actually living back, back with the family uh, because she's going through complications of cancer and just couldn't take care of herself. Uh, and then uh, another boy who uh, one day when, I can't remember if it was at practice or maybe one time we'd give him a ride back, he had come, he just made a casual comment to me about, yeah, my parents are always fighting. And I'm wondering, I'm wondering if they're gonna be getting divorced. And, and then another one that, um, he, I remember one day at a practice, I knew the parents were having some challenges, but um, you know, he, he we're right before a game, he breaks down and you know, kind of runs off the field as we're doing warm-ups and everything. And just because his, his mom had moved out the night before. And um, you know, with that one, it, I mean, he was just torn up inside. And uh, you know, with, with him, I, you know, was able to, to pull him off to the side there and just to help him kind of collect his thoughts and and I, I asked him uh, you know would it be okay if I prayed for you and, and he he did he said that was fine and um, and so I just prayed for him really quick and uh, you know he and his family and so forth but um, you know it, and it was neat to just be there for him in, in that moment but you, you know what I realized is as I was thinking about it and as I was sharing on that men's breakfast, these are just four families out of the 22 that I know of. How many more on this team, let alone all the other teams that we're involved with through the years, have families that are hurting? And, you know, we have a, an opportunity and a responsibility to, um, to be there for them, to be, a, to be a light in the darkness, to whether it's be an encouragement, to pray for them, to, uh, maybe be more proactive and invite them to church or, you know, get more involved in the, their lives. There's lots of things there. Yeah, yeah. Well, you kind of, are, kind of already answered kind of how I want to close is the how, right? So we know the why, that, that, that God is asking us to, to bring the hope of the gospel to all the neighbors around us and to see the opportunities, right? Um, and, and you've answered that, and you've kind of said, like, how do we do that? Well, being aware, right, is one of them. Um, and then turning those into prayer requests. Are there other ways that you've kind of said, how do I go about doing this and working with your relational networks? Yeah, and I think, I think it, it really does start with, with prayer and your personal relationship with God. You know, the deeper relationship we have with God, the closer we are with Him, uh, the 
higher the chance that we're going to see the opportunities around us. And not only that, have compassion for those people. Because uh, they are happening all around us. Uh, you know, whether, you know, a big portion of our lives is with sports. But there's other areas too. It could be work. It could be neighbors. It could be family members. There, there's just so many areas where we connect with people that don't know Christ. And we have an opportunity, if we choose to, to be a part of what God's doing out here. Yeah. Amen. I, I don't think I can say it any better. Um, well, we wanted to interview Dave again to, to show you uh, that even if you're uh, a father who has uh, four boys in sports, you can emphasize bringing the hope of the gospel to your neighbors. It's possible. It's doable. And opportunities lay right before you in all areas of life, including that busy sports schedule that we know many of you have. So thanks again for being here, Dave. You bet. Thanks again to Dave uh, for sitting down with us this week. One, one, one thing I really wanted to point out as I wrap up here with Dave is that his coaching opportunity gave him just an awareness of the brokenness that was around him, and he just began to pray. Why, again, do we do these things? Because there are broken people in our social circles who need the hope of the gospel. Let's be provoked to bring them that good news. And what can we expect? Again, maybe mockery, maybe curiosity, maybe belief, but I, I do trust that lives will be changed when we are aware. So here's one step in the right direction for my relational networks and vision house. Take some time this week to write down, to ponder three main people, uh, three main areas in your lives, friends, family, and coworkers. Think about what's going on in their lives and turn it into prayer. Ask people. Pray for them. Aid them when they need aid. Be provoked to see the gr grip of Satan loosen upon people. And again, I'm speaking to myself here. I realized this week uh, I had a staggering awareness that much of my social circle is based around this church, and I don't know my neighbors as well as I need to. I need to have a life that's filled more with non-Christians. I'm going to be doing that as I captain the My Relational Network's Things, uh, things together with, with, with Peter and the others. And then Mona Rosendahl and Barb Larkin are going to be co-captaining our Vision House efforts. We want to see change. We want to do things. And I'm inviting you to do this with me. Let me close in a quick prayer. Father, I just thank you that we've had this opportunity to hear from your word to learn more about Vision House and to ask ourselves how we can be more relationally involved in the networks that already exist in our lives. We just pray that you would keep us, uphold us, sustain us, show us your goodness and your mercy as we go about being people who have provoked hearts and can expect that even if people mock, even if people are just curious, that some may even believe and let's be a part again of seeing people made whole. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.